welcome you all to today's research seminar series. This program uh, we are organizing on Zoom and it is being broadcast live on the Facebook page of Martin Chotari. Uh, the title of today's seminar is Nepali Migration to Through the Other America. And our speaker is Andrew Nelson, Assistant Professor, Director of Graduate Programs, Department of Anthropology, University of North Texas. As usual, today's program has two phases. In the beginning, our main speaker will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes. Then uh, the second phase begins. So in this phase, we can uh, put questions and comments to our main speaker. Those who are connected through Facebook uh, can use comment box. And those who are on Zoom can use raise an option or use chat box. Before we proceed to uh, seminar, now I want to introduce our speaker. Andrew Nelson is a cultural anthropologist. In 2004, he did MA in Anthropology of Media from University of London, School of Oriental and African Studies. In 2013, he completed PhD in Anthropology from University of Virginia. He has conducted research on the organization of Kathmandu Valley, the experience of Nepali Bhutanese refugees in the United States, and the migration of South Asian people in Latin America. He has published academic articles in journals such as Himalaya, City and Society, Studies in Nepali History and Society. He has also co-edited the book, The Crux of Refugee Settlement, Rebuilding Social Networks, published in 2019. Now, I would like to request Andrew Nelson to give his talk. Andrew. Thank you, Harsha. Yeah, namaste, sopalai. Uh, as I say, English about the bolti, right? No problem. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Let me go ahead and um, uh, share my screen again. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I should start by explaining I intend for this presentation to be a merger of two different projects. And so bear with me. Um, one is as um, kind of a journalistic, uh, non-academic project for a, a book that's gonna be for a popular press on the journeys of Africans and Asians through Latin America on their way towards the United States. The other project is a more academic project, um, a more anthropological project on Nepali migrants in Chile. Uh, for this reason and other theoretical reasons I'll get to in a bit, um, I titled the presentation to slash through. <laughs> Uh, to, to embrace that ambiguity of the experience. Um, and, and thank you, Harsha. I completely forgot that I, the title was The Other America, and then I put Latin America here. So <laughs> it, it could be either one, it could be either one. So to begin, I will start with the vignette of someone I will call uh, Arun Magar, uh, because his story, I think, encapsulates much of what I'll be trying to communicate. So, Hold on one second. I met Arun in Inkinke, Chile in July 2018, and he quickly became my guide to Nepali, Chile. As one of the first 20 or so Nepalis to arrive in Chile back in 2010, he knew the community and its hardships better than anyone else. What makes his story so telling of the Latin American experience is not so much his time in South America, but how he got there. In a word, his life has been liminal and precarious since the outbreak of Nepal's civil war in 1996. From Ropa originally, his entire family uh, was involved in the insurgency. Four of his older brothers were killed by the military. and At that point, he fled to India. After the 2006 peace agreement, he moved back to Nepal uh, to meet his wife and child in Dung Valley. But at this time, he was unable to find work and started um, looking for opportunities abroad. But instead of the Gulf or Malaysia um, or some other common destinations that people often go to, he found himself pulled to a broker who promised a future in Europe. So he, would, he was promised uh, to first travel to Quito, Ecuador. And from there, uh, he was promised that he'd be able to get a visa to Spain. Um, but as so often happens, um, the, the visa did not work. So he paid about eight lakh uh, for a ticket to, to Ecuador. 
and flew there. Um, but then in Quito, Ecuador, his visa was denied to, visa, to, to Spain. Um, and apparently a member of his group had already flown to Madrid and was uh, deported from the Madrid airport and returned to Ecuador. This left him in Quito, uh, living above a restaurant in the central Carolina Parque neighborhood uh, with nothing to do really, but he washed dishes to, to kill time, to learn some Spanish and play soccer uh, in the park. For Arun, staying in Ecuador was not an option. He dismissed Ecuador as a garitas, uh, without opportunity. Since 2008, for reasons I'll explain later, a South Asian travel industry has been growing in Quito, full of mostly Pakistani and Indian uh, agents, but a few Nepali agents were there at the time in 2010. Um, and so with them, he started talking about possible destinations. Uh, and so he didn't have the money to go to the US. That would be about 10 lakh uh, that he'd have to fundraise to get from Quito to the United States. And also he was afraid of the dangers of that trip, uh, which I'd be happy to talk in the question and answer period because that's something I've, I've studied as well. Um, he was offered travel to Dominican Republic for about $2,000 or, or two lakh, uh, to Brazil for 4,000. Um, or Chile for, for 3,000 or, or three luck. Ultimately, he decided to go to uh, Northern Chile to a city called Inquinque, uh, a growing city in Northern Chile where a number of Indians own stores in the Zofri. And I'll talk about the Zofri later in the talk. It's a free trade so zone in the Northern part of Chile. And, the, and many of the Indian employers there were eager to, to hire Nepalese. Eight years later, he is still in the Zofri uh, working for a Sindhi boss uh, from Gujarat, selling fabrics to middle-class Chileans and merchants from Bolivia, Peru, and Argentina. But Chile is not a home, not a final destination. It is simply the next best option, a flexible adaptation, improvisation, until he could save enough to return to Nepal. And that is how I want to frame the larger conversation about Nepalese and South Asians uh, migrating to Latin America it's a place where someone goes to, uh, but also through, uh, not necessarily interested in staying or establishing long-term connections. It's an accidental or liminal diaspora made up of next best options or provisional plans. And that's really the larger goal of this project or these two projects to kind of reorient or, or discuss migration in terms of transit uh, instead of uh, instead of destinations, to emphasize the process, the experience of mobility, over questions of integration and assimilation. I'm not that interested in those kinds of questions because I think many of the people which I'm working are not interested in those questions. So let me back up um, and tell you a little bit about how my entry into this project. The first time I heard about South Asian migration through Latin America uh, was when a friend of mine in Kathmandu about 2010, I think 2009, 2010, told me about a plan to travel to Mexico and then try to enter and cross uh, the border to the United States. I didn't think much of it then until I returned to the States around 2012, 2013, I think. I started seeing short uh, Associated Press news wires, uh, these stories about South Asians, we're talking Indians, Bangladeshis, Nepalis, Pakistanis, um, being detained in places like Guatemala, Colombia, and Costa Rica. As my wife happens to have family in Nicaragua, uh, we often travel to Central America in the summers. So I started asking around and, and folks told me about it, a, a noticeable increase in the amount of people from West Africa, East Africa, and South Asia uh, entering Central America via, from, from Ecuador originally. So my interest was piqued, um, but I still really didn't know much of uh, what was going on until I returned to Kathmandu in 2015. Uh, just after the earthquakes that, that summer, 2015. I started asking informally about migration to Latin America, and it didn't take long to find all sorts of people considering the trip. The US had just announced TPS, or Temporary Protected Status, uh, for any Nepali who was in the US at the time of the earthquake. Uh, their, their visa status would be um, uh, a temporarily granted at that point. Uh, regardless of, of, of their status. Um, so back in Kathmandu, I heard a number of people who were uh, increasingly interested in taking the, the 10 plus country multi-continental trip 
to, to the, the Americas. I also stumbled upon the journalism of Surendra Pokhara, or sorry, Surendra Podel in the Kantipur. Um, and he'd reported on a number of different routes that people took uh, from Nepal to get to the US. And I spoke with folks um, who had traveled to places as scattered as Bangkok, Moscow, uh, the Gulf, and then were returned to Nepal uh, for one reason or another, you know, being scammed by their agents or being denied by immigration control in different countries. So back in Texas, I teamed up with a journalist friend, uh, Rob Curran, who was interested in the story. And we uh, went to Quito, Ecuador in June, 2016. Uh, and at first we just wanted to write a short story for a newspaper, the Dallas Morning News here, here in Texas. Uh, five years later, we're still working on the project and we're almost done with a book. Uh, it's titled Journey Without End, Migration from the Global South Through the Americas. And hopefully that will be out in the next uh, half year or so. And that book is based on this trip to Ecuador, as well as other trips to Colombia in 2018 and Guatemala and um, Mexico in 2020. Okay, so in Quito, we met Roshan Pokerel or someone that's the pseudonym I'm giving to uh, Roshan. He claimed to be one of the last Nepalis in Ecuador. Roshan flew from Delhi to Quito in 2010 and uh, originally from Kaski district, his brother and many of his friends had left Nepal for more common labor destinations in the Gulf, uh, Qatar, Dubai, Kuwait, places like that, where they worked in construction, gas stations, hotels. Uh, but Ecuador, that was certainly uh, not heard of. Um, he, had a, uh, he had heard of the South American country from um, a friend uh, from his village, someone who he referred to as Didi. Um, and, and she spoke of the beauty of Ecuador. It's a mountainous country, very similar to Nepal. And she said there are plenty of jobs there. So he paid uh, 5,000 uh, US dollars or about five lakh at the time. And a bit more than, than his friends had paid to go to the Gulf, um, but much less than the 30 lakh or so it would take to go to the US. So he entered Ecuador under the universal citizenship policy, which allowed any nationality, any nationality on earth to enter Ecuador and get a 90 day tourist visa. This was a unique possibility for many uh, people from all over the world to, to gain entry into the Americas. And so universal citizenship, we should understand it's a product of a leftist or Chavista turn in Latin American politics, specifically in Ecuador and Bolivia after Venezuela, of course, after Chavez. Um, and specifically it was the work of a, uh, this guy named Rafael Correa uh, who had a PhD in economics and became um, uh, president of Ecuador in 2007. So upon taking office, Correa established the Ministry of the Migrants. And he made this statement in which he declared a campaign, quote, to dismantle the 20th century invention of passports and visas, unquote. Quito quickly became a transit center for migration toward the US um, or southward towards Brazil, uh, Chile or Argentina. Within the first year, about 2008 or so, uh, Chinese migration to Ecuador exploded. And then soon thereafter, South Asians, as well as West and East Africans uh, started coming. So when Roshan first arrived in 2010, he said there were hundreds of Nepalis in Quito. Some were working, uh, most were waiting for agents to, to sort out their travel north towards the United States. Um, and so among a, a larger kind of South Asian network of mostly Indian and Pakistani uh, restaurant owners and migration agents, there were a few Nepali mig uh, migration agents in Quito at the time. And in fact, there was one Momo restaurant for a brief moment from about 2014 to 2015, I believe. However, by 2016, when I got there, um, Roshan told me, Sat Bagyo, US Gayo, Kohi Chili Gayo, Kohi Nepal Farkyo. And so he was one of the few left. Uh, him and his wife were there. Uh, the, the Momo restaurant owner uh, was actually there, but he was suffering from cancer and he later passed away in I think 2017. And then there were two agents who were actually arrested in 2014 and they were in prison when I was there in 2016. So 18 months after universal citizenship started uh, in 2008, Ecuador reinstated visa requirements for 10 nationalities. 
And there was a lot of pressure from the US as well as China to reinstate these visa requirements. Um, and so it was countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Eritrea, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Somalia. Those are the countries in which uh, all of a sudden you would need a visa to enter Ecuador. And so note, it's interesting that um, it, was, it was most of the South Asian countries except India. Uh, so folk could still enter with an Indian passport and not need a visa. Um, and I think that's because of the strong relationship between the Indian government and the Ecuadorian government. So even though this, this policy only existed for 18 months for these 10 nationalities, it was enough time for this real cosmopolitan center to emerge of um, an African diaspora as well as a South Asian diaspora in Quito. When I arrived in 2016, um, the La Mariscal neighborhood, it's a kind of a central tourist neighborhood. It's kind of the Tamel of, of Quito. Um, all of a sudden you had a number of uh, South Asian restaurants. I'll show you some pictures of some of them. Uh, so yeah, you know, Pakistani places. Um, here's Taste of India, uh, places with Tandoori named uh, Tadka was another name of restaurants. We have the Green Bangla restaurant. So these eateries were a mixture of kind of high-end restaurants, uh, mostly for, for upper-class tourists and Ecuadorians. Um, but they also had the more kind of fast food, like uh, they call shawarma uh, shops here. And the Green Bangla is very much a, a shawarma shop where you had kind of a mixture of Ecuadorian students hanging out, com coming for karaoke to get drunk or whatever. Um, a lot of Cuban migrants were there as well as South Asian migrants. <laughs> And almost all the South Asians we interviewed, um, you know, they talked about the restaurant and then they talked about the other industry, the, the sending industry of sending folks towards the US. So for those unable to afford travel northward, uh, Ecuador became sort of a trap. Um, from the manpower offices of Kathmandu, Roshan was promised $70 a day he can make in Ecuador. Um, you know, enough he figured he could, he could save enough money to go to the US. Um, but when he first arrived, he would just make five or six dollars because they would deduct his rent as well as his food uh, payment from his, from his paycheck. And he was working really a 12 hour shift, almost a day, seven days a week in many cases, rarely get a day off at one of these shawarma shops. And when we met in 2016, he was getting about $15 per day. And just to note, Ecuador uh, uses the, the dollar as their, their monetary uh, system. They switched, I think about 2006, they switched to the dollar from the Sucre. Um, and so his work conditions reminded me, really exploitative work conditions, uh, reminded me a lot of, the, of gas stations that I've seen here in Texas, where you have an Indian or Pakistani boss who's often ordering around Nepali workers. Um, as I was talking to Roshan, his Afghani boss uh, get, was getting angry, I could tell. Um, he yelled at the restaurant chef, who's a Bangladeshi, who in turn would yell at, at Roshan. Um, and you see the kind of this hierarchy of, of labor relations. Around 2011 or 2012, uh, the, the transit center for Nepalis coming through uh, South America shifted from Quito to La Paz, Bolivia. And that's because of that, that visa change uh, in 2010. When I met Nepali migrants in Colombia in 2018 or in Mexico in 2020, they had all entered the Americas um, via La Paz. Uh, well, actually first through Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, and then Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and then ultimately uh, to La Paz. And here are just some, some numbers. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this today, um, but if, in the question and answer, because this is part of that kind of that other project about people moving towards the US. Um, but I can certainly return to this in the question and answer. If anyone wants to talk about um, migration, you know, via the Darien jungle in Panama, the Panama Colombia border, um, as well as, as moving north. And we'll just take a minute here. Okay, sorry, just checking the questions. So you see, um, particularly for Nepalis, um, a huge jump around 2015 to 2017, right? So it shows that kind of, the Bolivian route uh, was when things really started to increase, not so much from the Ecuadorian route. And then same thing, um, this is statistics from the Mexican government. Um, and so you see the same thing, 2015, 
to about 2017 and 18, you see an increase in Nepalis who are being uh, detained, presenting at, at Mexican borders. So particularly the border with Guatemala. And then finally, here's a, a, a statistic from the US um, Homeland Security of Nepalis who have been detained at the US-Mexico border. Um, and again, you see an increase uh, 2015 to 2017, 2018. Uh, but again, this is an odd category because uh, it's deportable folks. So many folks don't uh, aren't counted here in this number. So that's why it's quite a bit lower than, than the numbers through Panama and through Mexico. Okay, um, so back to um, the, the, instead of moving north, a lot of people also move south uh, toward Chile, where I conducted research in 2018, and that's what I'll talk about for the rest of this presentation. The, the supposedly first Nepalis in, in Kinke, in that northern Chilean town, we'll call them Krishna and Arjun. Uh, they entered the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, in 2007 with promises of work in the Dominican Republic. So even before the Quito uh, visa option was available. And so they were told, come work in the Dominican Republic, and after a couple of years, you could transfer to the United States. But while en route, they were detained at the uh, Montevideo airport in, uh, in Uruguay and told they couldn't continue on to the Dominican Republic. And so at that point, um, they, they obtained a tourist visa. They found that if they bought a, um, uh, a, a ticket on a cruise ship leaving from Santiago, Chile, it was a way of getting a tourist visa to Chile. So they went over there and they got connected with this uh, Indian fellow who'd been in Chile, He's, owns many restaurants and hotels. He owns this hotel here in the middle of Santiago. Hotel Majestic. And uh, Krishna and Arjun referred to this as, a, as an Indian refugee center. Uh, so it became a place for folks who were kind of stranded, not sure what to do, uh, unable to go where they meant to go, where they were destined to go. Um, and instead, uh, they waited here for jobs to open or other opportunities, for other migration opportunities. So Krishna and Arjun stayed here, uh, working in the restaurant in the hotel, they stayed here for about two months, right in the center of Santiago. And then finally, they were offered a position here in, in, in Quinque, right? So they moved from Santiago to Quinque, which is about a 24-hour bus ride. It takes quite a long time. Um, because the, the owner of the Hotel Majestic happens to own a shop in the free trade zone in, in Quinque. Um, and so then they started recruiting uh, other Nepalis to come from Quito, um, uh, you know, such as Aru and other people who are all over South America to come to Enkinke because you had a number of stores there in the free trade zone that were owned by Indians who were interested in hiring uh, Nepalis to work there. So until about 2012, um, most folks were able to get a visa to Chile from applying from Ecuador or Peru or Bolivia and then enter uh, with, with documentation. Um, but that also, I'm sorry, in Sao Paulo as well. A lot of people are just staying there and getting visas over to Chile to work in the uh, trade zone. But this came to a stop in 2012 when the Chilean government um, identified and really targeted Nepalese and started cutting down on their visas. For the next three years, from 2012 to 2015, migrants would make more clandestine travels from Bolivia to Chile. Uh, what one uh, participant I talked with, he called it the Mauro Bumi route, right through the desert. Uh, the Atacama Desert is this area right here on the border of Chile. Bolivia. It's a very inhospitable place. So they would take a combination of buses um, and then get off right before the border and then sneak across the border by foot and then get connected with a private vehicle in Chile to go to uh, Inkinge. In 2015, um, another route opened up and this was um, a really interesting thing that developed via the Chilean embassy in New Delhi. So in an entrepreneurial college, I like to call it an entrepreneurial college, a, a profit-seeking college in Santiago, Chile, uh, connected with um, a number of educational consultancies in Kathmandu, as well as the Chilean embassy in New Delhi. And so essentially for about 10 to 15 lakh uh, rupees, folks could um, get a visa from New Delhi to come to, to Chile, an educational, a student visa. 
And so in Chile, they were supposed to be given master's degrees uh, in wine cultivation or tourism. Um, but then they were promised you could convert those uh, into work opportunities in Australia and the United States. Um, and they were told Chile was an English speaking country in many cases in the South of America, right? Which technically was, was correct. Um, and this new route, uh, let's see here, you can see the spike from 2015 up to 2017 of Nepalese obtaining visas to Chile. And that was all through the, the Chilean embassy in New Delhi. Let's take a minute here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, to Priti Pant's question, um, we can get to that in the question and answer. There was just one or two folks um, that were, were settled in Chile before uh, migrants started coming via Bolivia. Um, one person, I believe, was a physicist, a uh, computer engineer, and then one person had an automobile uh, company there. Um, all right, so let me talk just a little bit about kind of my theoretical orientation here um, before we move on. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing I want to say about the, um, the connection via the New Delhi embassy the Chilean embassy in New Delhi. Um, let's go back here. Um, so, so people would show up in Chile and, and soon realize that the master's course in Chile on wine cultivation or tourism was completely knuckly, completely uh, inauthentic. Uh, they would be there for about five months and um, the classes were a joke. Uh, you know, someone would be drinking wine in the front of the class saying, oh, welcome to Chile, it's beautiful here, enjoy the wine, right? <laughs> And then after five months, classes would come to an abrupt stop um, and folks wouldn't know what to do with themselves. Uh, they would be just stranded in Santiago. So some uh, considered returning home. Um, some uh, worked on low pay, uh, really low pay exploitative uh, fruit farms outside of Santiago in a place called Buin, Chile. And then some moved north uh, to Inquinque to the, uh, the shops, the Indian owned shops in the Zofri, in the free trade zone. Okay. Um, so on the surface, um, South Asian migration to South America exemplifies what sociologist Anju Mary Paul uh, calls stepwise or international stepwise migration in which labor migrants move in a quote, iterative fashion uh, up a hierarchy of destination countries. Denied entry to their preferred destination, they seek out intermediate countries with less restrictive immigration policies and accessible labor opportunities. Uh, or in the terms of Nepalese I met in Chile, um, they called Latin America, let in America. Um, and I think here there's a similarity with um, uh, folks moving to Portugal or Poland on the edges of the EU as a way of entering uh, the EU. And so I think Chile was kind of framed that same way. You could enter Chile, we could get a visa, and then move towards uh, other places, uh, Brazil, Argentina, or perhaps the United States. Um, so for, for a lot of people, Chile represents a progressive move. A lot of people had worked in the Gulf before coming, and they saw it as a socially uh, progressive move uh, from, from the Gulf, uh, better than the more repressive Gulf countries, uh, how they framed it. Um, but still not the United States. Many people wanted to reach the US. As one community leader, leader put it, 90% of Nepalese come to Chile with the US on their mind. They see the two to three year waiting period uh, for PR or permanent residency cards. It's a waiting period to obtain that US visa. But I prefer thinking of, of South Asian migration in Latin America, um, at least labor oriented migration um, in a less calculating way. Um, and I think I'm, I'm using the influence here of Jonathan Echeverri Zulaga, who's an anthropologist at La Universidad de Antioquia. Um, he got his PhD in anthropology from UC Davis. And he came up with this idea of errants um, based on research with migrants in Dakar, Senegal, and in Quito, Ecuador. Echeverri Zulaga theorizes errants as a state of being in which borders, people, documents, and identities are dislocated closed one day, but open to negotiation the next. Amid the fluctuating and provisional dynamics of errants, there are no destinations, no fixed destinations at least, um, just next best options for continuing movement. It's clear from speaking with Amar and others 
uh, that, um, or sorry, Arun and others, that the uncertainty and transitory nature of the journey is a defining part of their life experience. Errance even extends to the unpredictability of US politics. As one group joked with me, as they, they did a puja for Hillary Clinton to win the 2016 US presidential election, um, they added, Hillary Jitigo Bae, Hami America Mahuntio. So for many, being in the Americas, if not the America, um, it's, it's not like where they, where they intended, but it's close enough, right? It's still arguably America. Another member of the small but growing Nepali community in Chile commented, Hamele Pariwalai, America Bata Paisa Patancha, Baneho. Tinearulai, North South America, Farak Pardena. So indeed, um, social media accounts of folks also played with this kind of double meaning of America by identifying their homes on Facebook in US cities, uh, such as San Antonio, San Francisco, places where there's also a Chilean city of the same name, um, as well as cities where companies, the companies they work for had outlets. Okay, so let me transition now to kind of the, the second, um, I have three sections um, I wanna get to. So while the, the ZOFRI, the uh, Inkinki Free Trade Zone, and we can talk about the Cold War politics of this free trade zone later, has very much rooted in the 9-11, the, the first 9-11 I like to call it, when the US supported the coup of uh, Salvador Allende uh, and, and placed uh, Augusto Pinochet and neoliberal economics. So it has that kind of, it's very sordid history. Um, it represents a cheaper and more accessible destination than North America. It was based on the same exploitative conditions um, that Roshan was experiencing in Quito with his Afghani and Bangladeshi superiors, and same exploitation that many of the folks in Chile had experienced before in the Gulf. In the Zofri, uh, Indian shop owners speak of Nepali workers as a godsend, who arrived when they were struggling to employ their stores during one of the mall's big booms. In Nepalis, they found, quote, trustworthy and hardworking employees who conveniently understand Hindi. One cynical uh, Nepali worker, Maya, used the word pliable, the English word pliable, to describe how she, the Indian, her Indian boss sees her labor. She explained, uh, the Indian sound, he, he knows, Dinma, uh, South American worker lay, Atganta, Matre Kamgratsa. Uh, Terra Nepali worker lay, Das Bharaganta Kamgratsa, Dinma. She added, you know, to us, the, the Indians have, have trust, Bishwas um, Laksa. But for the, the South Americans, Bishwas Lagdana, they don't, they don't have trust in the, in the South Asian work or South American workers. And it's important to point out that there's a lot of competition, uh, particularly since 2018, when Venezuelans started uh, leaving Venezuela in mass exodus and going towards Chile uh, for work, amongst many other countries. Right? So there's a lot of competition between South Asian workers and South American workers. Um, but here's some pictures from, from the mall. And um, just to kind of explain the exploitation that takes place, Chilean law mandates that you can only work 45 hours a week, right? Or otherwise receive overtime pay. Um, so for many of the folks I worked with, they're doing six, uh, six days a week of work, 10 to 12 hours per day. So way over the 45 hour maximum. Um, additionally, they're supposed to be given 15 days of leave per year and that wasn't happening at all. Um, they're also supposed to be rewarded time and a half for work on Sundays and that, that wasn't certainly not working. So importantly, the, the Indian entrepreneurs of the Zofri um, have a long history in Latin America and um, they were first in the Panama Canal uh, free trade zones of the 1980s until the US invaded Panama and essentially ruined a business there. And they shifted south to, to Chile. And in Inquinque, in the Zofri, they found a niche market alongside Chinese commodity chains uh, in a wholesale market, as well as kind of a, a Pakistani um, corner on uh, the automobile industry. The Indian owned shops formed the oldest section of the mall. Um, where you find the, the less expensive duty-free retail goods, you know, such as perfume, electronics, chocolate, clothing, luggage, all the things you find in the airport in the duty-free section, um, as opposed to uh, the newer parts of the mall. And here's a picture of the mall. You can see the, the desert-like climate in the background, the Atacama Desert. 
Um, okay, so the workforce of the Zofri consists of diverse migrant groups who enjoy relaxed regulation and um, enforcement of state immigration policy, right? You don't find immigration officials of the Chilean state in the Zofri. The free trade zone is off limits. As such, the Zofri reflects the neoliberal exceptionalism uh, that the anthropologist Iwa Ong has described as, quote, a country within a country that has been carved out from the territory of the nation, encoded for economic freedom and entrepreneurial activity. Ong argues that the exceptionalism of these spaces mutates citizenship to encourage foreign investment, often using market logic to strip laborers of basic rights, turning them into secondary citizens. And I think in this case of migrants uh, on precarious uh, visa statuses, they become tertiary third-class citizens. While I argue that the Zofri undermines, certainly I agree, right, that the Zofri undermines liberal definitions of citizenship for workers, uh, the Indian boss Nepali worker dynamic is far from exceptional. Here I draw from Jamie Cross's work on South Indian free trade zones, where he interprets the informality and exploitation of the free trade zone as unexceptional, uh, since it often replicates the informal labor conditions of the outside. Building on Cross's point, the uneven Indian owner Nepali worker relations of the Zofri often replicate long histories of South Asian labor hierarchies. The unequal yet dependent relationship between Indian owners and Nepali workers echoes a perception of Nepali workers around the world as, quote, brave, hardworking, obedient. And here I'm drawing from the work of Tristan Brusley, uh, Jeevan Ra Sharma, Bandita Sijapati, uh, Shobha Hamal Guru, who articulate this kind of colonial mentality um, that permeates this relationship. You know, when employers use religious, linguistic, and uh, dietary connections or similarities as a way to justify e exploitation. And so you see this, whether it's in India, the Gulf or, or the US, you see it um, across many spaces. Here's a picture from inside the Zofri Mall. So most of the Zofri workers have la labored under similar conditions uh, in the Gulf or Malaysia. Uh, with, uh, they were working mostly for Hindi or English speaking North Indian bosses who expected really long hours. The only difference was they were speaking Arabic or Malay um, or Hindi uh, instead of Spanish in the everyday uh, relationship with customers. Um, and here I wanna draw from the work of Samita Tapa who finished a thesis on, on Nepalis in Chile in 2018 and um, she makes an argument that there's an alternative moral economy um, in which exploitative conditions are justified by both the bosses and the workers. It's a trade-off uh, for dependent and loyal relationships between owner and worker. As I heard from workers at the restaurant, um, at the restaurant, and there's a Nepali restaurant I'll talk about in a second in Kinke. Um, although workers knew that they were being exploited and asked to work much more than the 45 hours per week, they rarely saw themselves as victims. As Tapa uh, maintains in her thesis, workers tolerate their conditions in exchange for regular bonuses and fringe benefits, such as providing housing um, and uh, the occasional two every two or three years, um, sometimes, in some cases, a paid return trip to Nepal. And also, I, mean, I think Samita's work is really important um, because she worked with, uh, there's also another group of domestics who work in Chilean households uh, from uh, Nepali domestics who, who moved there uh, to work in households. And that's an element that um, I, I was not able to connect with th th those folks. And so uh, admittedly, my research is very gendered towards a masculine perspective of the male workers I, I met in, in Quinque. And so then moving on to one other field site, um, there's, there's a few of, uh, you know, uh, laboring working sites in Santiago, as well as in Quinque, but I'll just talk about one more for the sake of time. Um, so for those working with Chilean bosses, not working for an Indian boss, the same kind of exploitation takes place, but under more racist conditions. Just outside of Santiago is the fruit farm uh, that we're looking at right here. This is the gate entering the farm in a place called Buin, Santiago. And uh, I visited this labor camp where there's 22 workers who are living and working aside um, other discriminated classes in Chile, such as um, Mapuche indigenous groups, as well as migrant laborers from Haiti. 
The list of labor abuses here were long and detailed. And in fact, they have a, a pending um, uh, case in the Chilean labor court right now. Workers were consistently underpaid, asked to work under very unsafe conditions and given insufficient resources to live with here in the camp. Um, you can see here an image of um, uh, the dormitories where they're staying. So the workers would compare their situations to previous jobs in places like Malaysia, Iraq, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, even Afghanistan. And they would state, Chile has more because uh, than those countries. And Ramro Karania, right, strict laws, uh, but it didn't matter. You know, we're still sabanda tala in the, the class system. Okay, which brings me to my, my final section. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, probably getting close. I'll have about five more minutes. Yes. Sir. Okay. For this final section, uh, I return to Arun, the fellow um, whose migration narrative opened up the presentation. When I asked him to explain why Nepalese tolerated their labor conditions, he explained, or he laughed, explaining it was not so simple. Using language as a metaphor, he explained that Nepalese, as the lowest workers in the Zofri, had to learn and communicate in a variety of other languages Hindi with their bosses. Spanish with coworkers and customers, even the occasional Mandarin in the wholesale market or English uh, in some cases. Meanwhile, those with more privilege could force others to communicate in their native language as I'm doing right now in this presentation, uh, basically choosing my native language um, as a sign of privilege. Although forced language acquisition symbolized Nepali uh, position in the class hierarchy, the laboring hierarchy, it could also be a tool of tactical advantage um, that uh, Arun wanted me to think about. He elaborated by describing the tactical benefit of the migrant perspective through comparing the villager and the urbanite. He reversed the hierarchy of the standard development discourse um, that you know comes from 1980, you know, the stuff that Stacey Lee Pig was talking about in the 1980s and 90s, that posits the bikasit or developed city dwellers as more advanced than the abakasit, undeveloped villagers. For Arun, it is the villagers who are advanced because of their ability to adapt, stating, Saharma Jansa, Kuro Milansa. Videsh Gaere, same, Kuro Milansa. Bato Benansa. Yalko Manchi, Yasuri Ajaskarta. Tara, and then he reverses the equation. Bideshi Artavar, Saharko Manchi, Gao Gaere, or Gao Gao Bane, Ajaskarna Sagdena. So he went on to list the tactical of adaptabilities um, of the migrant worker to translate not only languages, but currencies, time zones, even global politics on a, a moment's notice. And at this point in the conversation, his flatmate, Ashima, uh, jumped into the, to the conversation to contrast Nepali worker solidarity with the Indian bosses, who she said, quote, Dani Bayapani, Yahad Chelima, Yiniaru, Extranjero, <laughs> Uh, status so Hami Jaste and extranjero uh, means foreigner in Spanish. So they were foreigners just like us and in the eyes of everyday Chileans. The difference is the Nepalis have other workers to be with, to cut costs with, to share time with, to organize with. And I will finish now by talking about just two examples of restaurants um, in Inkinke in which you see this worker organization taking place. So I wanna make the argument that these, these restaurants provide third spaces uh, between the workplace, the Zofri and the home in which they become spaces of solidarity uh, for the working class diaspora. So this is El, Rast El Rastorante Monte Everest. Uh, and in the mornings, the restaurant serves as a catering business for all the workers in the Zofri, uh, producing lunches for the workers. And then the afternoon, it turns into an ethnic restaurant uh, promising authentic comida hindu. And we can talk about the category of, of Hindu or Hindu in Spanish uh, later. Uh, it becomes a kind of a catch-all category for, for every all South Asians, not just people who identify with uh, Hindu religious traditions. Um, and so it becomes this kind of middle-class space in the afternoon and the evening for dinner and lunch, and particularly for, for Chileans seeking out vegetarian foods becomes like the hot spot. But then around 9 p.m., um, it becomes a social center for, for Zofri workers uh, returning from work, for the Nepali workers returning from work. So Lakshmi Bista, the Nepali Indian um, from Gujarat, she's the owner manager of the restaurant. And she wanted the restaurant to reflect her own cosmopolitanism. Her ease with multiple languages expressed uh, what Arun was talking about. 
with her main chef, uh, a, another Gujarati woman, they spoke in a mixture of Gujarati and Hindi. With the Nepali uh, kitchen workers, they spoke in Nepali, of course. With customers and Ecuadorian servers, she was fluent in Spanish. And then with me and other, and other customers outside of South America, she would communicate in English. She reinforced the cosmopolitan image of Monte Everest. Um, do I, have, oh, I don't have a picture of the inside. Uh, but you have you know, kind of this kind of hodgepodge of South Asian and South American imagery, um, you know, mandala art next to pictures of Machu Picchu and so forth. Um, and so, and then there's this kind of uh, flexibility on Lakshmi's part to um, combine, to be like this educator of South Asian traditions with uh, the Chilean public. She has a YouTube channel called Cocina with Lakshmi. So kitchen with, uh, or cooking with Lakshmi. Um, you know, she talks about how, um, you know, don't worry, the food won't burn you, it's not too spicy, that sort of thing. Um, and there's even an Asian fusion uh, section on the, on the menu uh, in which you have Chinese Indian hybrid dishes like Hakka noodle, Manchurian curries, Manchow soup. As one South Indian entrepreneur in Kinka explained to me, the sign of a true Indian restaurant outside of India is to have Chinese food on the menu because that's what we eat in restaurants in India. Uh, but no foreigner would ever want that. So for the Nepali workers of the Zofri, Monte Everest was a space of post-work social gatherings. It provided um, officially a, a monthly meeting space for Nepali Chile Samaj, a group to counterbalance the fact that there was no diplomatic presence uh, here, right? The closest embassy in, is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and after the 2015 uh, earthquake, this group got together and, um, and sent money to um, uh, villages in, in Gorka. And I should point out, this is very much a gendered social space, right, after work, um, that is male workers of the Zulf Free get together here. And so um, here's the kind of the plaque of the, the Samaj getting together. Um, and in 2017, they became more politically engaged, um, writing a letter to the foreign ministry in Kathmandu, as well as the embassy in Brazil, uh, demanding that recruitment agents tell the truth about the student visa scam that I alluded to earlier uh, via the Chilean embassy in New Delhi. Within a few months, to everyone's surprise, uh, Kathmandu police arrested three agents at a manpower agency. And further, in December 2018, two diplomats at the Chilean embassy in New Delhi were arrested on charges of corruption connected to the student visa scheme. And just last month, actually, um, this group got together and wrote a letter to Nepal's foreign ministry demanding an embassy be placed in Santiago. And there's many internal factions and fissures um, within this group as well, but um, that's perhaps another conversation. Okay, and so then finally, um, just talk quickly about this, the second restaurant, Sabores de Casa. So the, the flavors and tastes of the house is the translation of this restaurant. So unlike Monte Everest, which was established uh, via Nepali to Nepali um, business connections, uh, this one, the, the owner who I call Dipendra, um, was able to do this kind of rent to own structure uh, from the previous owner who was a Bolivian fellow who wanted to return home. Let's call him Santiago. And so for Dipendra, um, success was not guaranteed. Um, it was, he wanted kind of a lower financial risk. It was something seen as, you know, failure would not be devastating because of this rent to own sort of arrangement. Um, and so the restaurant kind of remained in this ambiguous space, what he called uh, local food that included beef, right? Um, but he had intentions or plans to create a South Asian kitchen. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the restaurant had to close in 2020. So he was never able to make um, uh, a South Asian kitchen, a second kitchen uh, in which he would not be cooking beef. Um, and, and it never became the hybrid restaurant that he imagined. Uh, but it's important to point out the contribution nonetheless of, of this restaurant because it's located in the migrant, whereas the uh, Monte Everest is located in the tourist center of Inquinque. So Bores de Casa is uh, located in uh, the more migrant heavy part of the more working class part of Inquinque, next to uh, open stalled markets, hardware stores, uh, chifa or Chinese restaurants, juice stands and Colombian empanada takeaway. As Dipendra explained, it was a Nepali space hidden in plain sight in neighborhood of migrants where he said, 
Hamra Atero Spanish, Bolipani, Manchile Hamilai Wasu Gardena, right? So we were essentially unnoticed in spite of our bad Spanish. So unlike the daily fluctuations of Monte Everest, um, here the clientele of Sabores de Casa was pretty consistent with working class migrants, both South Asian and South American, right? What we might call a kind of a form of subaltern cosmopolitanism was taking place here. So on the weekends, Nepalis would gather here to watch football games um, and socialize with their Venezuelan or Colombian co-workers. It was a place for cross-ethnic working class social relations. Sorry, not quite there yet. Uh, for Dupendere and his wife, Sushmita, Sabores de Casa did not represent a long-term commitment to Inkinke, right? And this is why I'm not really interested in the questions of assimilation and integration, but more this idea of the experience of, of transit um, as a framing idea, like right? this two through um, idea of Arantz that I was talking about earlier. And so here it was really just a, a, a scheme, a plan for um, Dipendre and Sushmita to gain PR status, right? To have that business connection expedite their ability to get permanent residency. And then hopefully be able to travel perhaps to Mexico, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, amongst many other places. And then ultimately perhaps get to the United States. When Sushmita arrived in 2013, Dipendra got there about 2010. Um, she started working in the Zofri and Dipendra, um, you know, Sushmita recognized the exploitation from day one and wanted the, um, the restaurant to be an alternative space somewhere they didn't have to work uh, under the exploitative conditions with, with Indian bosses. So in 2016, Sushmita quit the Zofri and started a home catering business, um, delivering food for workers in the Zofri. And then in 2018, they started the restaurant. Um, but when I was there, uh, just a few months after it opened, Sushmita um, shared with me, you know, I'll try this for two or three years, um, but we'll see, you know, we're not attached to it. Um, you know, she kept saying, hello, we'll see, you know, and, and she complained that there was too much masu, ati masu, all, you know, she, she wanted to, to shift to that more hybrid idea of a restaurant. Unfortunately, that never happened. So as a, as a final statement, um, in the flexibility improvisation of Monte Everest and the Sabores de Casa, I see the combination of the two points I've been trying to, to emphasize, or hopefully I've emphasized in today's talk. Um, you have Arun's villager consciousness, which is expressed in the ability to adapt and improvise, uh, to, to adapt to the precarious and shifting conditions of labor exploitation and unstable visa statuses and so forth. It is the practice of Echeverri Zulaga's uh, idea of Arantz, but, but taken beyond migration uh, to a more um, kind of experiential understanding of, of being, to embrace uncertainty and to make do with the next best options. And I will stop there and open up for questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, now we welcome questions and comments from our uh, participants. Um, I think there is a question from uh, Facebook. Have you addressed it? No, sorry, I'm not. So this question, uh, you can read, I think. Uh, so I can read. Did you encounter any professional Nepalese in Latin America? Are there any settled over there? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, absolutely. Um, as I briefly mentioned before, um, so if 2007, 2008 is the first time um, that the, you know, kind of via Ecuador or via Bolivia, Bolivia uh, migration started. Um, there were, I believe, two folks in Chile, in Santiago. Um, one person who came as a computer science student um, and also had a kind of, a, he got a PhD in physics, I believe. Um, but uh, from what I could gather from the other folks in Santiago, he was very hard to get in touch with and, and start, tried to stay distant. And then there was someone who started an automobile uh, industry in the, um, this kind of central part of Santiago, the um, Estacion Central, this central train station. And it's kind of this booming gentrifying neighborhood uh, because of Chinese investment, East Asian investment in Santiago. Um, it's a really interesting place. And uh, he employed a number of, of both South Americans, Nepalese, Indians, a number of people there in the automobile industry. And he became really an anchor for the South Asian diaspora there and, and really helpful to my research. Uh, so yeah, a few that I know of. And I should also point out that Sao Paulo, Brazil um, has a pretty uh, large growing uh, diaspora of Nepalese as well as South Asians. 
um, but it's, it's not a place I know anything about. So I imagine there's also a lot of professional investment there, um, but not in Ecuador. In Ecuador, you have um, mostly just Indians who are investing professionally, uh, particularly through Tata. Uh, Tata has a large kind of um, subsidiary there in Quito. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, you can raise your hand and uh, let me know. Uh, I think Jeevanji has uh, put many questions. Uh, Jeevanji, do you want to ask yourself? I think that will be better. Uh, sorry, uh, Arsha Ji. Uh, am I audible now? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Andrew, for that very uh, comprehensive and informative uh, presentation. Um, this is one of the very uh, under research area, at least for, 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 for Nepal and the police, I would say. Uh, so uh, my first question to you was in regards to the financing of uh, this trafficking and smuggling of Nepalese to uh, America via uh, some of the countries on the routes that you just mentioned. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, they can't uh, fund their uh, migration from Nepal because they need to take the permit, I mean, permission uh, from uh, Rastra Bank uh, for the foreign currency. So uh, obviously that has to be through the informal channels. And in one of my research, particularly in Qatar, I had identified that uh, these, uh, these, uh, these patterns of migrations was facilitated uh, mainly uh, through the financing of these irregular channels, including from the countries like Qatar and uh, UAE. Uh, and then this also has implications on the way that the Hundi system functions globally. Uh, so that's one, one question. And I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, whether and how these traffickers and smugglers would operate differently according to the closure and openness of the routes uh, that, 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 that unfolded uh, during the course of time that you did discuss earlier. Yeah, thank you, Jeevan. Those are great questions. Um, apologies, I just had to make sure my power didn't die on my computer. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first one. I mean, that's a really complex question that, I mean, can, there's so many different ways to talk about this. And I should point out that the bulk of my research for the smuggling routes towards the United States have been more with uh, West African and East African migrants. Um, so I can tell you all about Eritrea networks through the Gulf and financing that way. Um, but the little bit I've, I've learned with the policy, you know, a lot of it comes from, um, you know, uh, the, the work from uh, CESLAM, uh, you know, the group of so social science Baha and all the, all the access to all the things that you've all been doing for the last couple of years. Um, but from the little bit I've talked about, it's usually the case of um, land put up as collateral uh, with an informal money lender in, in the, the town or village or whatnot. And we're talking, you know, 30, 33% uh, loan rates. And so, you know, particularly for the folks, the most the guys, the people I've met the most, I guess, are the returnees, the ones that like one person made to Singapore um, and then his Dalal disappeared um, and he had to take a flight back uh, via Bangkok back to Kathmandu. And um, he had tried, I think three different times to get to the Americas and each time it failed, right? And so he was looking at massive, massive debt um, as well as loss of his family's land and, and so forth. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, I think the Gulf route makes sense, right? And that's certainly the case that I found with East African migrants um, via UAE specifically. Um, and that's usually people that hang out in UAE for about a year or so um, as a way of financing the route. Um, and the other interesting thing to point out is that, and this gets into your second question about routes and openness and knowledge, Knowledge is so insular uh, throughout, right? I mean, so for the majority of folks, they're doing things like driving people from um, safe houses to hotels to bus routes and so forth, right? Or they're taking them to restaurants and getting them just to the border. So everyone has kind of a very narrow definition of what their job is. And for the most part, I think most agents or, or coyotes, you might call them in, um, in Spanish, um, Think of their work as doing humanitarian work, right? Of helping migrants to continue moving northwards. 
Um, and oftentimes that is indeed the case, right? There's very little kind of overall oversight of the route. Um, but having said that, the folks in Quito, particularly there was um, an, an Indian man from Gujarat and a, a Pakistani fellow um, who every restaurant I, we ever went into, they would always be there, um, you know, talking to potential migrants, both about financing or continued financing, right? Because usually in my experience, people would put down maybe 15 lakh to get to the Americas, to get to Bolivia, to get to Ecuador. And then there's a whole new round of financing that takes place to continue the, the trip, right? And you kind of pay piecemeal as you go along. Um, and that's why the coronavirus was such a, um, a nightmare because it shut down a lot of those um, currency transaction businesses. Um, and so people essentially became stuck. Not to mention, of course, all of the, the health, um, public health uh, mandates that went out to, to close down borders. But having said that, um, these two fellows um, that I met in Quito were willing to talk about everything. Uh, it was really interesting because they, they talked about how, oh, you shouldn't be asking questions about that. No one's going to talk to you. And then they proceeded to kind of tell us everything. <laughs> and we'd ask, well, how do you know that? We said, oh, they just hear things on, on Facebook, right? Um, and so it was really interesting for that kind of middle point, that transit point. And I think La Paz, Bolivia has become that transit point somewhat after Quito was essentially shut down for non-Indian migrants. Um, um, I think there are just a few handful of people, right, that um, uh, were willing to that new kind of end-to-end -end, uh, transactions. Um, and then when you get into Central America and Mexico, things get even more, much more complicated. Um, and there's a few Bangladeshi networks that work from Tapachula in the southern part of Mexico up to the border right on the United States. Um, but that's where things get really violent and you, you don't ask questions in that situation, um, as opposed to Ecuador where things were much more open and much less criminalized, I should say, um, as opposed to Mexico where it's much more violent, much more criminalized because of US uh, you know, war on drugs uh, as opposed to, and as well as uh, war on migration uh, that's taking place. Thank you. Uh, do we have other questions? Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'm just curious, um, though um, this is my this is not my subject. Uh, I was curious because, um, uh, as just uh, earlier said by Jim Bania uh, about this human trafficking. So, is this migration human trafficking? So the or the technical. Yeah, the, the technical definition of trafficking is being um, smuggled against one's will. And so this is technically not trafficking. Um, I guess the more appropriate term would be smuggling. Um, but, you know, I mean, these are <laughs> what, what, what is force and what is free will in these situations? Is it kind of a, a lot of gray area there? Um, because obviously people make the choice at some point, right, to get on a plane. Um, but particularly with the folks we're working with from West Africa, uh, East Africa and so forth. Uh, there isn't much of a choice there, right? I mean, these are refugees that are being forced out of their homes. Uh, so yeah, it, it gets really complicated. And then when you enter the Americas, the, the question of choice also becomes really rather complicated, right? Because it's like, yes, you wanna continue northwards, but under what conditions, right? And oftentimes you don't have any control over those conditions. And, and particularly in the Darien jungle between um, Northern Colombia and, and Southern Panama, this is a place, right? It's the one place where um, the the the, the uh, Pan American Highway just shuts down. There's about 25 miles, 40 kilometers or so, where the highway doesn't go because the jungle is so dense. Um, and in that part, it's extremely dangerous, um, you know, because of human causes as well as natural causes. And, and we argue in in, in our manuscript um, that this is on purpose, right? This is the Panamanian state in cahoots with the United States makes it more difficult. Uh, and we know we, we could easily take people from Colombia and skip the entire Darien, but instead they have to go via mig uh, migration agents and coyotes uh, through very, very dangerous conditions. Thank you. We have a question, um, Chad, I think. Uh, are there any enabling factors that is supporting ne Nepalese migration to Latin America apart from economic? Yeah, good question. I think, I mean, family reunification. I didn't get a chance to talk about that at all. Um, but yeah, thanks for that question. That's an excellent one. 
that uh, particularly in Santiago um, and in Quinque, in the zoo free and the free trade zone, people weren't interested in bringing their families. I mean, there were a few uh, families, but in Santiago, it's very different. Uh, uh, the, the population of Nepalis amongst a much larger South Asian community is growing very quickly in, in Santiago. And um, as I mentioned, after the kind of the visa scam via the, the Chilean embassy in New Delhi got shut down, really the only way that people were able to get visas um, for the most part, of course there were exceptions, but for the most part was via family reunification. Um, and so that happens often, right? Um, wives and children or husbands and children, the even parents coming over uh, and getting connected. And I think in addition to that, um, education as well, right? People that were coming on the scam, the so-called wine uh, tourism uh, visas, uh, but people who are entering Chile for educational visas. But I, as far as I know, they're pretty few and far between. Thank you, Andrew. Do we have other questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Or Andrew, do you want to add something which you couldn't tell earlier? Um, yeah, there's, there's so much to, to talk about. I, I, um, uh, well, I mean, I guess one thing I could talk a little bit about is where I'm taking this project next, at least I hope. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of we kind of building on this idea of, of subaltern cosmopolitanism or South-South uh, um, intellectual collaborations. Um, I'm thinking about studying uh, doing kind of an academic study of South Asian studies in Latin America. Uh, and so one thing, and this would be very much a, a Martin Chodari sort of uh, a project, right? A, an anthropology of anthropology or a study of academics. Uh, but I think it'd be really neat um, to learn the, there's a particularly a college, Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City that has a very vibrant South Asian studies um, department. And so I'm thinking about uh, maybe doing a project with them there. And in thinking, you know, more kind of long-term about um, the South American, South Asian um, or Latin American, South Asian, um, you know, uh, political uh, connections and questions of solidarity and so forth um, that might emerge from, from departments like that. Yeah, um, I think we have another question uh, at, on chat. Do these migrants have thoughts for reverse migration back to Nepal? Are they sure, yeah. Back to Nepal? Absolutely. Um, yeah, everyone wants to return for the most part, right? I mean, I think, it's, I mean, going back to your previous question, I was just kind of thinking about all the exceptions, and there certainly are even some that I didn't mention, right? I mean, folks that see, particularly amongst youth uh, who came on the visa scam, some people didn't really mind being scammed because it was a way of getting out of Nepal uh, because of whatever family disputes or, or social relations for whatever reason um, to be perhaps with a, with a partner uh, before marriage or a partner that people weren't allowed or, or families wouldn't consent to marriage. Uh, that was one kind of escape to move to Chile together and be together with a partner. Um, now, having said that, um, yeah, there's a constant conversation about returning to Nepal, right? And it's just a matter of, I mean, I think oftentimes people kind of do this, this math work or this calculation of how many years do I have to, you know, pay off the loan first off that, that paid for me to get here, um, get the visa status, right? So I can return and have options for future travels. Um, and then finally, make enough to go back and uh, be able to purchase land, you know, preferably um, on the outskirts of Kathmandu, um, amongst Pokhara, amongst you know many other places. But like, you know, kind of the same things we see a lot with with Gulf workers, right? And it's kind of like, how long do I need to pay off the debt and make a little bit to invest uh, or reinvest back in Nepal? Um, thank you, Andrew. I think uh, the. There's no more question. So I think um, we need to um, finish today's program. I want to thank um, Andrew for a wonderful presentation. I, I want to thank all the participants also uh, for uh, giving time for this program. Um, thank you all. Uh, I request all, uh, all to participate in our other program. Uh, let me uh, inform you about our next program. So it is in Nepali. Uh, you would say, Unadis Bodo, Duja Ototar, 14 September 2021, Mount Desa, your Modest Nepal Modest Foundation, Ramadin Sotarko, Senta Ajana Mohnevu, 
मधेश आंदोलन र मधेशी पार्टी भन्ने विषयमा हो वक्ता चाहिँ प्रोफेसर कृष्ण हासेतु राजनीति शास्त्री तपाईहरु यो प्रोग्राममा पनि आउनु होला या थ्यांक यू भेरी मच एन्ड्रु एन्ड फर अल